And let's again return to our series on the attributes of God. Now for this Sunday we will head into the attribute that is called the goodness of God. The goodness of God. And we have looked previously at some very uh, amazing and at the same time terrifying attributes of God. His, his sovereignty, His holiness, His uh, omni, omnipotence, His omnipresence. All these things we rejoice in. All these things we, we see, they, they are truly amazing things in our God. But at the same time, they can also be terrifying. What if we have a, had a God that was, was uh, uh, sovereign, all-powerful, almighty? but was not good. Would we not fear that God so much if he had all those things we have looked at? He's holy, he's without sin, he's, he's ever present, he sees everything we do, he can do everything he wants. And if he was not good, what hope would there be for us? So this Sunday we will turn to something that I hope and I, I trust it will be a, a, a a blessing for us, something that we can just rejoice and we can just sit back and relax and, and look at the goodness of God and, and rejoice in it. Not just so much be terrified of, of who our God is, and He is a terrifying God, but let's just enjoy our God this Sunday. As, as the uh, first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever and enjoy. We, we often come to the, pack, the, uh, the first part that we should glorify Him. That's true. It's important. We should glorify Him. But let's not forget, it continues to say that we should enjoy Him. Enjoy God. So let's enjoy God this Sunday. We, we have, a, uh, we have a, a, a mountain to climb here with, with all the texts I have prepared. So, so let's, we, we shall not waste a whole lot of time on on, on, on the intro, but I, I, I wanted to just get you into, into the right state. You come and, and enjoy God. Come and enjoy God. If you're here and you think that this is just a theological lecture or whatever, come here and enjoy God. You don't have to be theologically smart to enjoy God. Even a child can enjoy God. This is for you to look at God and see that He is a truly good God, a truly Good God. So, what do we mean then when we say the goodness of God? What is, what, what does that mean? I, I, I trust that we, we are familiar with the word good. We don't think we necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time uh, defining that. But let's always be, be, be uh, careful and qualify a word. Goodness, or good for short, is the opposite of evil. Good according to the dictionary, something that is pleasant, honorable, enjoyable, very satisfactory. So here we have something that is very satisfactory, very enjoyable, very uh, honorable, pleasant, something that we should enjoy. And obviously we, we, we know that, we know what goodness means. I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to make, us, make fools of us by explaining the obvious, but again, getting us into the right frame of mind. We're here to enjoy God. So, the term, the goodness of God, is actually something that defines goodness in itself. Because whatever God is, that is good. Whatever God is, that is good. Goodness comes from God. We don't have goodness as a, in, in a vacuum that we can define and it's separate from God and then we can apply it to God. But actually, it is goodness that comes from God. And everything that we look at and we can see is good. People are good. Food is good. Uh, sun is good, at least in some sense. Uh, having health is good. Everything comes from God. Goodness at the, is at the very core of the being of God. In Exodus 33, 19, God says to Moses, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. So in this verse, in Exodus, God says that, or he, he, he represents his goodness as something that is, that is uh, his identity. My goodness will walk before you. Of course, it was God who, who walked before Moses, but he said that whatever you 
can experience of me, whatever your, in, your finite mind might take in, it is my goodness that walks before you. It is at the very core of God's being. So everything that God is, is good. Everything he says is good. Everything he does is good. Everything he decrees, everything he foreordains, takes away, gives. Everything that comes from God is good. Everything inside him is good. Everything in his nature is good. His creation that he created before the fall was very good. There was nothing, there was no evil, there was no bad, there was nothing opposite of good in his creation. There was just good. If there was no creation, if there was only God, there, was, there would only be goodness in the universe, if you could call it the universe, you know. If there was only God, there would only be goodness. And Jesus makes that point as well, that God is the sole source of goodness. In, in Luke 18, 19, no one is good except God alone. That, that pretty much excludes everyone and includes only God. No one, meaning everybody else, is good except God alone. And everything good comes from God. James 1, 17, you probably know the verse. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation of shifting shadow. So, we can receive goodness from God. Or we, we can, by receiving goodness from God, display goodness ourselves. Goodness doesn't exist within us as, again, something that is separate from God, but it is by receiving from God, by reflecting His goodness, that we can show goodness to others, to other people. Even unbelievers can show goodness. Even they can receive goodness from God and reflect that to other people. It is Always that way, because God is the only source of goodness. In the words of the Puritan writer Stephen Charnock, he says that God is good by his own essence in none other, in that none other causes him to be good. Nothing causes God to be good. It is not that he goes and, and looks into the, 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 uh, the spring of goodness and, and goes and digs up some goodness and then gives it away. No, it, it, it exists in him. It comes from him. Now, we can display and, and show goodness, but only by receiving it from God. So then, how can we see that God is good? Let's... Let's also look in our Bibles and, and see what the Bible says about the goodness of God. God shows His goodness in various ways to various people, various categories of people, various groups. So uh, I, I wanted to, as I, as I prepared it, I, I was thinking how to, to uh, divide this, these uh, groups and, and uh, the various ways that God shows His goodness. I'm going to do it in, in three groups or three categories of recipients. First. I wanted to see God's goodness in dealing with his creation, meaning man and animals and everything that's alive. And second, let us consider God's goodness in dealing with mankind in general, believers and unbelievers, all men, men and women. And then third and final, let us consider God's goodness in dealing with his elect people, with his elect people. So let's begin with the first group. First group, and we'll turn to our first text for this Sunday, Psalm 104, verse 25 through 28. And we'll see how God shows His goodness through the animal kingdom. Psalm 104 and verse 25, and we'll read down to verse 28. This is what it says about God's goodness to the animal kingdom. O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. There the ships move along, and the Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give 
to them. They gather it up. You open your hand. They are satisfied with your good. Or with good. So this shows us the generosity of God. How he feeds all his animals, all his creatures, every creature that he has created, he cares for. He, he, he generously gives them what they need. He gives them good things. He, he, the multitude of animals, and there are a very great multitude of animals in this world. I don't know if you, you, you like biology and, 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 and the study of, of, uh, of, of animals and, and fish and so on. But if you do, and if you ever go and watch a documentary on whatever, there are so many animals in this world. We don't even know a, a fraction of them. All the fish in the sea. I think I, I, some, somewhere sometimes someone said that we only know a, a tiny percent of the seas of the world. We only know a tiny percent of the ocean. There is so much left to explore. I don't know how, if you have ever been to a, a great ocean, maybe uh, the Atlantic. I've been to the Atlantic a few times. Not the Pacific, but the Atlantic. But it's still a very vast ocean. If you stand there at the shore and you, you look out on the ocean, it's, it's nothing but water. Nothing but water. Or if you've been up in a, in a, in a plane and you, you look down and you see nothing but blue. And in that water, in that ocean, there's full, fullness of life. There's so many creatures, so many fish and, and other creatures who live in the sea. And all these multitudes of insects, bacteria, he feeds them. He gives them what they need. And they are satisfied, it says. They're satisfied. They're not struggling to, to, uh, to stay alive. Uh, some, some animals are other animals' food. That we know how that works. The food chain. Some animals eat other animals. And that, that's how it works. But still, everybody is satisfied. From the smallest microbiological life to the greatest creatures in the world. God feeds them and he feeds them generously he gives them what they need let's turn to another psalm psalm 145 just one verse there 145 verse 9 145 verse 9 it says the lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works just this one verse. But still we see that God cares for all his works. He does not leave parts of his work to their own devices. He does not leave them to, to uh, make them feed themselves. Or, or he, he cares for them. He cares for all his works. He, he remembers them. He has them in his infinite mind. We, we try to, to uh, map everything and categorize everything and try to, to uh, put everything into books so that we can comprehend it. But God has everything on his mind all the time. All the small works and the great works that he has done are constantly on his mind and he cares for them. Let's look at another psalm as well. Just a couple psalms ahead. Psalm 147 uh, and verse 9 as well. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. This is just another example of God caring for his animal kingdom. The ravens, the birds they who fly in the air, the beasts on the ground, everybody gets from the good hands of God. And of course, we know the, the uh, famous verse from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. We know what Jesus says about God caring for his creation. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26 and forward. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> if I can find it. After chapter 5, verse 26. Uh, next page. Where he says, in, in, in uh, reminding his disciples not to worry. He says in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow or reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth, worth so much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. 
They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that, they, that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and, will, uh, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? God cares even for the lilies in the field. He gives them clothing. He gives them life. The birds in the air. Everyone is cared for in God's kingdom, in God's good creation, because God is good. Even those who cannot praise Him, even those who cannot know Him and honor Him and worship Him are still fed by God. How much more will He not care for the people that He has created in His own image, the men and women that are representatives of God, that are images of God. How much more will not care for them? This is the second group. We will consider the group of all men, believers and unbelievers. And it's, it's easy to see around us the goodness of God to all, all men. And we, we, we as believers have many privileges, but some privileges go to all men and, and, and believers and unbelievers alike. Everybody can enter into marriage. Everybody can have children. Everybody can have a career, can, or at least in, in our country, we, we have that freedom. We can, have, uh, we can have education, we can travel, we can enjoy God's good creation, enjoy the colors of the world, enjoy the smells, enjoy the tastes, enjoy the food. This is not restricted to believers. Every single man and woman enjoys God's goodness in this sense. Music, sounds, knowledge, all the things that we look on as good things comes to us from God, to all men. And we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Jesus says again, uh, talking about the, the uh, evil and the good, the unrighteous and the, the righteous. Verse 45. Uh, yes, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. God sends his rain, not just to the believers, but to every man, so that they can grow their crops, they can uh, drink the water. He sends his, his good and, and to good people and evil people. He cares for even those who are his enemies because they are his creation. That's how good God is. People who reject him, people who hate him, people who can speak nothing but blasphemies against him, still God cares for them as well. That's how good God is. And Paul says in, in Acts 14, 17, you don't have to turn there, but Paul says that the nations were not left without the witness of God, for he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This is a witness of God, his constant goodness, giving rain, giving food, giving everything that people need is a witness of God witness of God. God deeply cares for mankind, for all men, men and women. All people are the recipients of His goodness. Sometimes we think that just because we are His people, just because we are saved by grace, that we are somehow more worthy of God, God's goodness, but God show, showers His creation, his, and especially the people of creation, with goodness, with gifts, that, so that they are satisfied with food, with gladness. And this is true goodness. This is true goodness when you give to someone who do not deserve it. Give to someone who cannot deserve it. And this can, of course, lead to envy among believers 
We see it in the Bible. We probably see it today among ourselves as well. We envy the unbelievers when we see how much good they have. When they have money, when they have clothes, when they have possessions, when they have everything going for them and we become envious. Let's turn to one psalm and we see this Psalm 73. It's not a story, but it's a psalm and we see the envy of the, the psalmist Asaph. It's, he's called the writer of Psalm 73. Verse, we'll read verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. The temptation to unjustly complain to God. In verse 3 and 4. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death and their body is fat. Why, Lord? Why do they receive so much? Why, Lord, do you give so much good to those who hate you? Imagine getting that complaint to work. Someone would complain to you, why are you so good to those who hate you? It's absurd, actually, when we think about it. Why are you so good? Well, I'm sorry for being so good. Let, let me repent of my goodness. No, it's absurd, but it is a temptation, for, a temptation for believers to become envious, to see how much goodness God gives to unbelievers, to wicked people. To become bitter, to look at their body's fat, doesn't mean that they're unhealthy or unexercised. It just means that they have received much goodness. Their body's fat. Why, God, do you give so much good? Because God is good. This is, however, not the end of the unbelievers. As we saw in the, the psalm today, and we see it here as well in verse 17 through 19, the psalmist says... Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. And what is the end? Verse 18. Surely you set them in, their, in a slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. This is the end of unbelievers. They might enjoy God's goodness now, in this life. Temporary goodness. Their body is fat. They have possessions. There is no pain in their death, yet their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. And their end is coming. Their end is coming. Yet God now bestows His goodness on all people. In this life, on this side of the grave, on this side of the Lord returning in, in, in His second coming in, in glory and power, God bestows goodness on all people, unbelievers and believers. There will come a time where there will be no goodness for the unbelievers, when they will be in the lake of fire. And the only thing, oh, God will be there, but there will be no goodness of God there. He will he withhold His goodness and there will only be wrath. Yet right now, right here, as we live, as we speak, we see God showering people with goodness. And really, we would all end up in that lake of fire, in that very end destruction that the psalmist talk about. We, that's, that's the default location or destination for all people. When you think about it, it's, it, it's a common myth to think that only bad people go to hell. Only the murderers, only the, uh, the uh, rapists, only the really bad people go to hell. But, but I am not so bad. But really, it is the default destination for all people. That's where we're all going. That's where we're all going. And if it was not for the patience of God, which is another way he shows his goodness, that's where we all would go. If when we sin and we sin, when we transgress His law, our punishment would be immediate death and hell forever. Yet God shows us His goodness in this way that He patiently waits. He patiently waits. How long does God wait in the days of Noah? How long did He wait for people to turn before He sent the flood? 120 years was Noah building his ark, preaching righteousness, preaching repentance, preaching
preaching that people would turn back to God. That's how long God waited. Have you ever waited 120 years for someone to repent to you? Someone has wronged you. People don't live 120 years anymore, or very few people do. But if, if, if we go a week without someone apologizing to us, we feel greatly offended. Now, God waited 120 years in the days of Noah for them to repent. Noah preached and preached and preached, and no one came back. Yet God shows his goodness in that he patiently waits for people to turn. He patiently waits for people to turn. He waited for us. He waits for those who reject him. He waits and waits and waits until there is no more waiting. That's how God shows his goodness to believers and unbelievers. And we can, you don't have to turn there, but we'll look at it on Wednesday as well. Second Peter chapter 3, where he, he speaks about God's patience and goodness to, to believers as well. Chapter 3, verse 9. If you want to turn it, you can do it, but I'll, I'll just read it. The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is patient with the unbelievers and especially with his believers, that none of them would perish. None of God's elect would ever die in their sins. That's how good he is. He waits for you. You might go your whole life. Think about the, the thief on the cross. How long did he live in his sin? Up until he was so close to dying. He was, he was minutes or maybe hours away from death. And God waited on him. God waited and waited until that thief saw Christ on the cross and he repented and was saved. That's how long God waited. For one soul. His whole life, God waited on him. How long suffering is God? How long does he wait? And now let's, let's then turn to the final group we've already talked about. The, the final group, God's goodness towards his elect people. Because there is, of course, a certain, time, a certain kind of goodness that God shows to his elect people, to his saints. We, we have different or unique ways of, of experiencing God's goodness that no one else does. Not the animal kingdom, not the unbelievers, but only the believers. And in what way can we see it? Well, first of all, we can see it in the fact that we can pray to God and He answers our prayers. We can speak with God. He answers back. He gives us what we ask for. Not always, because we ask for bad things and he gives us better things but God answers our prayers Matthew 7 and if you want to turn there that's the primary text for for God answering or maybe not the primary but one significant text Matthew 7 at the very end of of the Sermon on the Mount verse 7 through 11 we have gone through it in the Bible study, the men's Bible study. We will, we'll look at quickly at it, the text here as well. Matthew 7, verse 7 through 11. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake, will he? Will, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? And I think the last word, verse really captures the goodness of God. How much more? We understand to give good things to our children, I hope you do. You give them gifts, you give them clothing, you give them food. That are, those are good things, even if they don't always appreciate it, but it's still a good thing. And 
we understand that that's, that is a reflection, of course, of, of God's goodness towards us. But we see here that God gives us even more. We understand to give good things to our children or those of you who have children. Or to our families, to our friends, people we love. God gives us even more. When we ask for stupid things, when we come and say, Lord, give me a snake. He does not give us a snake. He gives us uh, something better. He gives us a, a, a fish instead. Or when we ask for a stone, God realizes, you cannot eat a stone, my dear child. You need bread. Of course, these are just images of, of uh, something else. We might not actually ask for a stone, but it is pictures of what we do when we come to God. When we pray to Him, and we do not always know what to pray for, God still answers us by giving us even better things that we don't even know we deserve. That's how God showers us with goodness. God is so good to His people. God is so good to his people. And most importantly, God is good to his people in their redemption. In the greatest gift of all that is Jesus Christ. His son he has given to us. His son he has given to us. How do we see that? In that God is very determined to save his people. God is very determined to save his people. In his goodness, God sets his eyes on, on, on saving his people. He lets nothing come in the way. He lets nothing stop him. Even, even when, when Jesus was tempted to, to uh, not go to the cross, we remember Peter coming up to Jesus and rebuking him and taking him aside and saying, no, 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 Lord, you will surely not die. Jesus probably was tempted at that point. Do I really need to die? Do I really need to die for these people who always sin, who always fall short? Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He recognized the temptation. He recognized the uh, temptation to not save God's people. But God is determined. Jesus is determined. He has set his face on Jerusalem. He, his face is like flint. I will do my work. I will do the work that God, my Father, has given to me. I will save my people. And God always works for our good. We know the text. Let's, let's turn to one final text. Romans 8. We know that text, but let's turn to it. Romans chapter 8. And verse 28, which we all know and quote very often and for good reasons. Let's look at it. Verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. All things working together for good. Where the suffering, hostilities, opposition, sickness, death, frustrations, disappointments, all things still combine to work together for good, for good. How incredibly good God is to his elect people. And how is this connected to redemption? Let's look at the next verse, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that we would be the first, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. God works all things for good to us because he foreknew us, because he predestined us. To what? To become conformed to the image of his son. We are to be like Jesus. We sinners, we who are small and weak and fragile and nothing like Jesus are conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Conformed to the very perfect incarnation of God. We are conformed to Him. We are to be like 
brothers to him, brethren. We're not only calling him Jesus, our Lord and God, but we're calling him our brother. Our brother, like we were his family, and we are his family. God shows us goodness to make us like Jesus. What a wonder. Not only are we forgiven, which is great, we need forgiveness. Not only are we declared righteous, which is also great, we need to be righteous before God. But we see that we are conformed to the image of Christ. We are to become like Him, like many Christs, walking together with our big brother Christ, being like Him. That's how much God showers us with goodness to make us like many Christs, many Jesuses. And he gives us more gifts as well. And these he gives us, as we saw, gift of prayer, gift of the community of the saints, the gift of preaching of the word. The word itself is a gift that God gives of his goodness. But even more than that, he makes us like Jesus. We will become like him. Not, we will not be him. We will not never be God or God in the sense that he is, but we will become like him. Not even the holy angels are given this exalted state to be in the very family of God. The, the angels who are before God's presence all the time and serve him, not even they are given this exalted state. That's how much God showers us, showers us with goodness. We will be like Christ and we will rule together with him. We know that in Adam, in, in creation, was, was given dominion over all the earth to rule over God's creation. But in Christ, we're given even a greater dominion over the eternal kingdom. We're going to rule with him, together with him. That's how much God gives us his goodness. And he does not end there. Next verse. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. The golden chain of redemption. Everything is linked. Everything is certain. Everything is secure. God's goodness in redemption secures our final end, which is glorification. Glorified bodies, glorified state with Christ, ruling with him, being like his brethren, being in God's family. The end which we are not, we have not reached yet, is God's unbelievable good gift to us, his people. So then, what can we do in, in light of all these things, knowing that God is so good, especially to his people, his good to his creation, to all mankind, and especially to his people? What can we do knowing that first, be humble, be humble. God's goodness to us is not, is not the fruit of our goodness. It is not because he rewards us, because we have been good people I and mean, we have done great things. Be humble. Don't boast. Don't lift up your head. As Job says, I am, if I'm righteous, I dare not lift up my head. Even as God's call, God's elect, God's people, be humble. It is a gift. Second, be grateful. Be grateful. God hates a thankless heart. God hates people who are thankless. Ingratitude does not work in front of God. Thankfulness keeps our praise of him warm. It keeps, his, keeps it alive. It keeps it pure. keeps it focused. It will protect us from a cold praise of him, a, a form of ritualism that will just be lip service to him. So be thankful. Be thankful to God. And third, be content with God's goodness. Be content with God's 
goodness. God gave everything to Adam and Eve. Remember the story? He gave them the whole garden and he forbid them only to eat from one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and, and, and evil. And yet they disobeyed. Yes, yet they became discontent and ate from that very tree. We must not become discontent. Be content with God's goodness. We must remember that. And finally, that leads us to our final point. Fourth, remember God's goodness. Meditate upon it. What is the uh, primary way for God's people to turn away from God? By forgetting. By forgetting. Forgetting who God is. Forgetting what God has done. Forgetting his word. Remember God's goodness. Meditate upon it. Just, I, I told you at the beginning, just sit back and enjoy it. Just relax and enjoy. But meditate upon it. Remain there. Remain in God's goodness. Meditate upon it. How much good he has given. Not only you, but your family. The, 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 your extended family. Your, your relatives. Your friends. Every people on earth. All the animals on the earth. And he cares so much more for you. His elect. Meditate upon God's goodness. It's when we become proud, thankless, discontent, forgetting that we have rejected God's goodness. It is easy to do, but it's wrong. So meditate upon the goodness of God, which we have looked very briefly, I must say, this Sunday. There would be much more we could see. But in light of all these things, remember what God has done for you. And to end this Sunday, I, I also want to give an exhortation and a call to repentance for you who do not believe, who are part of God's creation, created in His image, but who have not bowed your knee to God, to Christ. God has given you everything that is good in your life. God is still showering you with goodness. He is patiently waiting on you. He is to this day not taking you away from here. He has not sent you into hell. He has not done what would be just and right, which is to judge you. But he has kept you alive. For this moment, perhaps. For knowing him. For knowing who Christ is. Now is the day of salvation. Now let's turn to God. God calls everyone everywhere to repent. That includes you. That includes everyone. So repent this day. See that God has been good to you in waiting on you, in giving you life, in giving you health, in giving you a place where the word is preached. Some people were never given that opportunity, but you have been given that. So Christ calls you this Sunday. I call you this Sunday. Repent. Turn back to God. And be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord and our Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sunday to, to thank you again for the goodness that you show us on us. The, the undeserved gifts, the mercies that you continually give us. Lord, we know we are not worthy. But still you give us goodness. Oh, Lord, keep us from being discontent, from being thankless, from, being, uh, from forgetting you. Oh, Lord, we are, we are so prone to end up there. We are so prone to forget who you really are and what you have done to us. Oh, Lord, for, forgive us our sins and keep us in this state of remembrance of who you are. Keep us in this state of rejoicing in you. And Lord, we pray for those who do not believe and who has heard the message this Sunday that you would speak into their hearts, Lord. We know that they are dead. They are dead in their sins and transgressions. But Lord, you can save them. You have showed them patience to now. Lord, save them. Show your goodness in the ultimate gift that is Jesus Christ. 
Oh, Lord, please save them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.